This is Trisha here with Insectopia. We're going to be sketching together again. I know some of you, um, hopefully some of you guys are new out there in the world. I know a lot of us have been coming back every week and, and spending a lot of time sketching together. And I have absolutely loved it, so I love to keep it up. Um, today I have this insect right here underneath the microscope. It is a Koreaid or a leaf-footed bug. I thought that he could be really cool to sketch just because of his variety of um, crazy leg features and we'll be able to flip him over and check out his mouth parts and stuff. Um, because this is a true bug, he has a piercing and sucking mouth part. Um, and he actually, something that identifies the species is this, um, like the ty hmm jugum and tylus. I think the tylus is the one in the center. It has this like spiked tylus. Um, what I was just doing, I want to make sure that I know how to spell his scientific name before we really get started. Because I recent I ID'd this one all the way to species. I was pretty excited about it. I just want to make sure that I get it right. Doop, doop, doop. Where is it? Is the comment not there? So, how's everybody been doing this week? Um, I guess my question is, uh, are there insects that you were looking forward to seeing or checking out today? Or everyone's cool with kind of talking about, talking about true bugs? Anyone seen any cool insects over the last um, over the last week? I've been seeing pictures of um, I've been seeing pictures of moths that are coming in. So we finally got some mothers out there taking pictures, and it's making me really, really want to go out and collect bugs. Um, I've been really missing kind of being outside and and just kind of like being a part of something larger. So I'm looking forward to doing that. There it is. This is the western leaf-footed bug, Leptoglossus clippialis. So um, we can just go ahead and start there. Um, so this is going to be, the common name is the, the western leaf footed bug and um, his his or her Latin name is Leptoglossus clipialis and that clipialis um, is in referring is in reference to the clipius which is that that spine off the top of his head Lepto glossus. All right, so we've got our common name, we've got our scientific name. Um, these guys are in the family Koreidae, or all of the leaf-footed bugs. Um, sometimes people get them mixed up with things like, um, sometimes people get them mixed up with things like assassin bugs, because they have a very similar, um, they have a very similar kind of body shape, but um, what's unique about these fellas is that they have, well, it's a little difficult to see from a dorsal angle, but you can see right about here on the tibia, it's like flattened and expanded, and the foot actually, the, the leg actually looks like a leaf. Um, so that's going to be one of the characteristics to identify this to family. And then if we're going further and further, getting it down to species, this dorsal, this um, line across the hemiolytra um, helps out getting it, closing, getting it a little further. But really your key characteristic, other than like the color and the shape and those types of things, is this spine up here in the front of his head. Cool. Yeah, so 
Um, as many of you already know that have been kind of hanging out with me, I like to start at the front, I like to start at the head, and then work my way backwards as I'm sketching. Um, I know that many of us like to have scale bars or have an idea as to kind of the size of our insect almost even before we start. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom all the way out and hopefully get you a little bit of a scale bar. If he'll fit under the microscope, hopefully he'll fit. Because I did go ahead, I promised some of you guys that I was going to calibrate my microscope so that I could measure. So I did go ahead and do that. Let's see, and so from the head to about here, he is 1.3 centimeters. And then I'm going to scooch him down. We're gonna, we're gonna imagine that that line is there. And we're gonna add just, we're gonna add the end. I know it's probably not the best way, but it'll get us pretty close. Here, this is what we'll do. We'll go from this line. So from the scutellum down to the end of his abdomen, he is 1.1 centimeters. And then from From here to the front of his head, he is approximately 0.6 centimeters. So you've got 1.7, he's about a centimeter and a half total. So that gives you an idea of where we're starting. And I want to get his, look at how long his antenna are. Look how impressive those guys are. That's kind of cool. Okay, so maybe I'm, well, we should start with this view and then we'll zoom in and then we'll zoom in on the head to get the characteristics. But I wanna be able to see those antenna so that when I'm sketching, I can compare the, um, do you have any specimens of the nymphs? I do not have any nymphal specimens of this guy. Um, I don't collect very many immature specimens just because um, they're a little bit more difficult to uh, they're a little bit more difficult to ID for scientific purposes and um, they sometimes don't hold up to time as well. Uh, a lot of times when you're collecting immature insects overall, you're throwing into an alcohol. Um, and I do have a small alcohol collection. Uh, it's just not as expansive as my uh, pinned collection. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and kind of get the shape of our head started with kind of two lines that are in, um, like coming together, merging together like this. And then um, he's got, kind of comes forward. And what I will do is I'll give myself a basic shape, right? So we start with something, we start with something simple. And this guy, he went a little bit to the left. So we're going to try that again. Silly guy. All right, um, so we're gonna go boop, boop, and then we're gonna just kind of give ourselves always working off a center line, keeping in mind that um, insects are, are, are symmetrical, right? So um, you wanna make sure that they're the same on the left and the right. Um, and then after we've got kind of a basic shape, we can go in and add a couple of things. Um, for instance, I want to make sure that he's got these eyes, and the eyes do come off of that shape just a little bit. Yes, Marley, we are working with a hemipteran. Um, hemipterans are the true bugs, right? And then, other than that, we are working with a Koreidae, which is a leaf-footed bug. And if you want to get even more particular, this is the western leaf-footed bug. Okay. 
Alrighty, and so now um, I like to make little, um, you can see kind of right about here where the um, antenna kind of hit the side of the head. The antenna come off of little shelves on his head. So instead of building them into this shape here, I'm going to give myself like this line and I'm going to build his head out just a little bit so that he's got that fun little shelf there and we can erase this inside line. And you'll see over the course of time how this one kind of basic shape can turn into a fairly detailed buggy shape. All right, making sure to round this out a little bit and then making sure because it's the characteristic for the species that we have that, um, that, we have that really sharp point in the center. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to get these antenna going, uh, probably I'll go both sides. It'll almost look like it's surrounding the, the name. I just like to start my, um, I like to start my sketch pretty high up because I don't want to have to, uh, cut him off on the bottom. All right. So that first end, um, end tunnel segment is actually pretty wide, um, and it kind of gets wider before there's like this thinner one, right? And so if we're looking at antenna segments, a lot of times in previous insects we've looked at, they are, um, in previous insects we've looked at, there are a lot of little itty bitty segments, right? Like the tarantula hawk, we didn't even count the antenna segments because um, there were so many and there wasn't really worth counting. But in Koreans, we can count the antenna segments. We can say, all right, we've got one, and then we have two, this very long one, three, and then four. This guy only has four antennal segments. So making sure that we, um, that we uh, give credit to that, right? So one, two, and his segments are just going to go off my page, and that's fine. It's going to happen. Three, four. He says, I'm reaching for the stars. All right. One. Two. Three. Four. All right, so I put that one just a little further out so that I could hopefully get the entire one in. All right, let's zoom in on this head and check out some, act some features a little closer. Zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. There we go. Oh, there he is. Cool. All right, so we've got a variety of really awesome characters here to check out. Um, he has these really awesome compound eyes here, right? And then if we look really, really closely right about here and there, um, our specimen does have two little ocelli or little itty bitty simple eyes right? These are those light sensing eyes that can't really see shapes and colors, but they can see light and dark. So they have the ability to kind of see shadows, see things flying overhead, watch out for predators, that type of stuff. Um, so uh, making sure, let's see, I'm going to pull this guy in just a little bit and then um, I'm going to go ahead and give these little stripes on the sides of the head. Okay. Um, and then moving on back. So from our head, um, check out, there is a little suture or a little separation line right about here that moves like in a little arch. So when we're combining, when we're putting his head on his pronotum or on the first segment of the thorax, we're going to make sure that that line arches just up a little bit before we move forward. Okay. All right. So 
we are looking at the pronotum. It's very, very triangular. And it has shoulders. It's got little itty bitty points on his shoulders. So making sure that we get those in there and trying to make sure that they are even. So we're just gonna go ahead. <coughs> I'm feeling much better than last week, ladies and gentlemen. I know I wasn't feeling super great last week. This week I am um, feeling much better. All right, so I've got little shoulders, making sure that the shoulders kind of are even on both sides. Um, sometimes I'll even go over a little bit and then erase to, just to make sure that the line stays even. Um, all right, coming down. And then we have this line right here, right? So it comes down a little bit and protects this scutellum or that little triangle bit. So... to be seen. Something like that. Um, and even in the center, there is a little notch that comes up. So as you're kind of making this, um, as you're making this shape, you can kind of make it and then add in characteristics as you see fit. Something along that line. Um, and then the coloration from the head does move on to the pronotum just a little bit. And I'm going to, I'm just going to give him that little triangle, this little diamond right here. Okay. So we've got just a little diamond there. He is pretty speckled. He's got this really cool um, exoskeleton features where he's very kind of speckled. He has these fun little colors. Let's see. Moving on down. All right, this is where we get to see some of the fun parts, right? So I think that the hemiolytra are really cool in true bugs, just overall in general. Um, keep in mind that kind of where we see where this and this comes down, that's gonna be where that's gonna be where the scutellum starts on both sides, right? So that's gonna be our triangle. And I like to add the triangle first and then um, and then put the wings around it. It gives me a little bit, it helps me with the center line, right? Because we want to make sure all of that stays even. And then right at the very, very end of this, of this spine, we've got the wings do connect in a fair, fairly evenly right about here, right? So if we are, if I'm sketching right about in this area, um, you've got this line. And then they're going to break apart from each other. Bloop. And working from the center and then doing the outside has um, does kind of help me keep everything in line. All right, and then he does, you do want to make sure you keep that spiky shoulder in there, right? The shoulder is not where you're connecting your hemiolytra or your wings to. You want to make sure that it, you're connecting it just um, a little bit further in where, where the natural curve comes. All right. Okay, so we can't see much further than that right now. Um, and when we are looking at these wings, I'll say things like, um, I say things like hemi elytra. And I think some of you know what that means, but um, hemi means half, right? So um, when we're talking about hemi elytra, we're talking about wings that are half membranous and half kind of leathery. 
Um, so this up here is like a leathery part of the wing. It's a little bit thicker. You can see there's like a little bit more structure there. And then as we move down the abdomen, you can see almost right about here where it looks like there's almost like a little bit of plastic wrap on our bug. That's actually the, that membranous wing or that very, very thin wing that you're going to have lots of veins in. Um, and then on top of the, underneath the hemiolytra, they actually are going to have a pair of membranous wings. All right, so making sure we get this body shape together. Um, we're going to zoom back just a little bit. I like to draw the whole body before I go back and add the, uh, and add the legs. So we're going to zoom out to get us an entire, a whole image. There we go. All right, so something that we'll see here is that this insect is not, um, when we're drawing our, when we're drawing our wings, the wings pretty much came all the way vertically. Um, and they're going to come in just maybe even a little bit more than this. They're not going to move out at all. Doop, doop, doop. Doop, doop, doop. Okay. Um... And what I'm doing is kind of imagining this hemiolytra on top. So I'm just giving it this little bit of a wing. There. So something, something along those lines. But then you can actually see the abdomen coming out from the sides of the wings here and here, where you're seeing those kind of that striping pattern, that dark light pattern along the edges of the abdomen, um, that is something that you can see past the wings. So maybe right about here where the wings start coming in a little bit, just giving yourself a little bit There we go. And so now we can see that we've got these two little slivers, and those little slivers are those sides of the abdomen. And you can even go back in and kind of color in those stripes. Um, I think that that's going to give our insect a really cool, um, a really cool and very accurate uh, sketch of what he looks like right at this very moment. And let's see. And then making sure that the stripes, you'll notice, are the same on each side. So making sure that they're about the same length and um, they're even with one another. Each one of these individual lines is likely going to be another segment of the abdomen. So if you wanted to get even more crucial, you could, you could give yourself those little angles that we've made in the past at the base of each one of those, um, at the base of each one of those lines. And that's just going to give you these little itty bitty triangles. Right, so you're gonna start in, you're gonna move out and then come back in. And that'll give it just a little bit more of this like angle show. Yeah, I like it. Okay, um, so I'm gonna go back in. Let's see, what do we think? I think I wanna get this line across the center taken care of. <laughs> Uh, there is some variety in this um, in this horizontal kind of light line across the uh, across the hemiolytra. So when we're sketching it, it's okay if this one is not as. So you'll notice the left side isn't all the way symmetrical as the right side. There's a little bit of differences. So as long as we're staying pretty similar, there's also a large variety in the in just the species in general. So you've got this line, but sometimes it's a little wider, sometimes it's a little thinner. The um, these guys can be kind of lighter or darker just depending on just depending on their genetics essentially. All right. Um so Let's see, I think we should zoom in on the wingvenation so that we can check those out. I love, 
Wing Venation. It's one of my faves. All right. So, in Koreads, in leaf-footed bugs, you'll notice that in the membranous area of our wings, we have lots and lots and lots of parallel veins. Um, in some hemipterans, it is a distinctive characteristic that there's maybe only four or there's five. And I believe Rejuviids, the assassin bugs, are going to have um, a very small number of cross veins. I'd have to double check that before anybody wrote it down. But um, you can see we've got all of these veins coming in this direction, and then the wing underneath has them going in this direction. So when we are sketching, so when we're sketching these veins, we can essentially just take and make these very, very light kind of cross hatching. And it will give us it'll give us the texture it'll give us the texture of what we're looking for in our um, in our membranous wings. All right, we're getting somewhere. Um, let's check out some legs. I think I'm going to sketch my right legs. I know that lots of you, ladies and gentlemen, will have time to sketch both sides. Um, I feel like a lot of times when I'm chatting and talking and sketching all at the same time, I only really have time to draw one of the like one side. Um, all right, so we are checking out these legs. Um, keep in mind, he's kind of uh, he's in this position where he's walking, so I'm not going to be able to get his entire leg in focus at the same time. Um, right up here, this is our femur. And then if we zoom a little bit, this is going to be our tibia. And then we have one, two, three individual tarsal claws. Those tarsal, um, they're like little toesies, right? And then at the very end of the tarsal segments, we've got tarsal claws, which are these two little guys right here. All right. Um, something that um, as I teach le insect legs, I like to think, you know, insect legs aren't that much different from human legs. Um, if you think about the bone structure, right? So in our legs from our hip to our knee, that big bone in there, it's called the femur, right? So we've got a femur. And I could zoom in just a little bit, but I am here to tell you that right here, he's got a little femoral spine. And if you know me, I love my little spines. I love tibial spines. I love femoral spines. So, yeah, um, that's where we're going with that. Now, you're going to get our tibia up, the, up here. Let's see. I'm really excited about seeing those hind legs. Um, hmm, maybe I do want to move it down. I'm trying to figure out which direction I want this tibia to be. You know what? I think I'm going to do it this way. Yeah. Um, so I've got a tibia. And the tibia is, you know, we're, we're just going to go underneath the antenna. That's just what's going to happen. And I want to, I'm going to zoom in a little better so that I, when I'm sketching the toes, I can make sure that I get all the little stuff. That's what's cool about sketching with a microscope. You can just zoom in as far as you want. <laughs> All right, so tarsal segments a lot of times are triangular or long rectangles. So this first one is a longer rectangle, and it goes underneath my antenna. All right, and then I've got two triangles. And two tarsal claws. And it actually, you'll notice that there is some additional little pads here. I think those are called pulvoli, something like that. Um, and there's an hourly footed bug actually has two little pads right, um, right next to his little tarsal claws. So the tarsal claws are kind of for sticking and holding on to things, but then the pads are 
not sticky. I don't know exactly what the pads are going to do for our friend here. I wonder if they could be used to clean. <laughs> yeah, um, Marley, I think that it is kind of funny that, um, that we have that insect and both insects and humans have such similar leg, um, but I'm not sure if the insects were named after the humans or if the humans were named after the insects. I would think that we had named human bones before we named insect, um, insect leg segments. All right, so actually you can see on the middle leg that the, um, the femoral spine is a little bit more um, obvious on this guy. So he's got femoral spines on both his front and his middle legs. So it's femur and then tibia, like between the knee and the ankle, we have a tibia. He, they've got a tibia. And then it does get a little weird when you get down to the little toe segments. But if you think about it, our toes are called metatarsals, right? And insects just get tarsals or tarsi. The pads help them climb slick surfaces. So do the pads, so then maybe the pads, do the pads have like little suction cup hairs on the bottom of them? All right, I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. I just want to see where this leg is coming out from our body. All right. So if we are looking, looks like the leg comes out right pretty much. You know, I've got the worst luck with where I write things on my paper. I'm always going through words that I've described to you guys. <laughs> oh, man. We're going to erase it. Luckily, I wrote it in pencil. We all know that we're working next to the hemielytra now. Um, always keeping in mind that a lot of times when insects walk, your front legs are moving forward and the middle and the back legs are moving backwards, um, giving us this little femoral spine, um, pointing uh, towards its abdomen, and then coming back in, we've got a tibia. It's long and thin. And then we have um, some tarsal segments, and it looks like the the middle leg is pretty much the same as the as the front leg. So we've got this longer rectangle um, and two triangles with our claws and our little pads that um, that help us stick to surfaces. Huh. <sighs> Cool. And then the hind legs. The hind legs are the most awesome, but they're a little less awesome from the dorsal side. So what I think we're going to do, what I've been planning on doing, is sketching the leg as we see it here. And then we're going to turn the specimen and we'll all be able to sketch the leg from um, a lateral point of view so that we can see all of the cool, um, all of the cool uh, leaf-like features of our leg that help him kind of blend in with his environment. Now, we got to kind of picture this in our head a little bit because the, the, once we get to these segments, these stripes, that is the abdomen of our specimen. Okay, and the leg we know connects to the thorax. So we have to keep in mind that the leg is probably connecting way up here and then moving through and underneath. So we can still kind of start at where the abdomen starts, just keeping in mind that um, the leg is actually connected way up here. So giving ourselves that little bit of a, um, a reminder as we're sketching so that we can kind of imagine the angle is what I'm going for. All right. So the femur is pretty is pretty thin still. Um, you can see that he does have a variety of spines, actually. I think he probably has three or four femoral spines that we can see 
um, from this view. Uh, we'll have to see how many he has when we're going down. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take essentially the center line of the tibia and give myself the center line of the tibia first, right about here. Um, and then... Doop, doop, doop. I want to see what his toes look like. What do your toes look like? All right. His tarsal segments are pretty much the same as all the other ones. So a long square, two triangles, and some hooks and pads. All right. Rectangle, two triangles, hooks, pads. Okay. And then we can add this really fun leaf pattern. So it comes out and then moves in. Now, it's a little bit difficult to show this on a dorsal view. That's why I think that we're going to go ahead and um, that's why I think we're going to go ahead and give ourselves a lateral view of this leg. Plus, I think it's one of the coolest features of these specimens. So, I have enough little space right about here to do that in. Is everybody um, is everybody good with where we're at? Does anybody need to go back and see anything? I want to make sure that everyone is happy with what we're able to see. Let's see. We're going to do this one. Mm There we go. So cool. Look at those spines, man. There's something kind of wonderful. There's something that makes my heart happy about watching an image like a really close image of a leg going from kind of blurry into this really strict really um really clear focus i just love love watching it come into focus um so we are looking at this leg and so if we're looking this is gonna be our femur um we can see a little bit you see this little uh it almost looks like hmm i don't know it looks like a little ball coming off the bottom of this leg. That's actually the coxy. Yeah. That's actually the coxy or kind of where the, the femur hits um, the hip where and that's what helps connect it to the leg. So that's kind of a joint down there that's going to help my insect um, kind of move its leg back and forth, kind of like our hip joints. Um, then we're coming up. We've got this femur. We have the tibia. And this is our really awesome expanded tibia for our leaf foot. He's got some fun little spines on the edges, too. Maybe we'll zoom in even further. Um, and then coming down for the tarsi. So I'm going to go ahead and start getting this sketched. Let's see. Where do I want to start? I'm going to start on the femur. Don't bump it, Trisha. And a lot of times I give myself the, uh, the shape and then I go back and add the spines just so that, um, if the shape isn't right, then I want to be able to adjust it without having to adjust every individual spine. And it looks like the spines actually are going to continue all the way down. Um, I'm just going to let it continue into darkness. <laughs> And 
And the top of your femur, where the femur connects to the tibia, is going to have this little bit of an angle. And that's what's going to help um, connect the femur to the tibia. Um, you can see the central kind of structural piece of the tibia though, right? So you can see that almost like a leaf has a strong central vein, you can see that the tibia also still kind of has a strong center vein. Um, and that's going to stay fairly thin and long, so I like to start with that and just kind of sketch the inside, um, which is just a thin, it's thin and long. And then I'm going to go back and add the fluff around the edges. <laughs> Marley, I love that. He's got bell-bottom pants. Oh, man. I loved bell-bottoms in high school. I had wet pants, you know, the bottoms of those bell bottoms. No good. Alrighty, and then moving out the other side. Okay, and then the tibia actually does continue, so we're going to go ahead and take all four of those lines, right? The line from the outside, the two lines from the inside, and this line from the outside, and we're going to continue all four of them down until they touch well enough that we feel like, okay, and then continue it just a little bit further, right? Um, and that did get just a little bit dark exactly where I want it to be light, so I'm going to go ahead and just take a little bit of that off. Yeah, something like that. Um, and then going ahead and adding our little tarsal friends. And it looks like our little tarsal segments have a lot of hair on them. And th those hairs are a lot of times to help them um, to help them climb and hold on to things. It helps with friction, essentially. Um, So, if we zoomed in really far on these little toes, we probably could see huge tufts of hairs that are almost like brooms. Let's see. Is this a bad tasting bug? I wouldn't want to eat it. Um, the question is, does it have scent glands? Um, does it release a toxin? And I think that they do, yes. Um, what insect are we illustrating today? We are illustrating the western leaf-footed bug. Um, this is the, uh, this is a species of Koreid. It's a species of leaf-footed bug. And its scientific name is Leptoglossus clipialis. All right, so these are the hairs that I was look, th talking about, right about here, where you can see that they're very, very concentrated and almost like a comb. Um, those are going to help my friend stick. So if we wanted, we could go ahead and just add all of those, a little bit of texture by giving those hairs along the tarsal segments. Um, and... We could add a couple hairs around that area too. So we've got our leg. There's our, our name for our friend here. All right. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and write hind leg next to that sketch so that we know what's up. Um, and I'm going to show you, Marley, so you asked about whether he has, he's kind of bad tasting. And I believe, and I'll, 
It's been a minute since I have identified these guys and looked at this one under a microscope, which is kind of why I chose it. I wanted to, you know, stretch a little bit and see what, um, just play with a, play with a new friend. Um, and I believe that this specimen, we're going to have to check. Let's see. Oh, don't drop, don't drop them. Oh, this specimen was collected in Arapahoe County, Colorado, if anyone is interested. I think that's it. It's normally between the second and third pairs of legs. There is something I'm looking for to show you. Yes! Aha! I am 90% sure that that is our bug stink gland. <laughs> so, um, yes! My, um, my leaf-footed bug does have a scent gland, meaning it does have the ability to um, release a toxin that doesn't smell good, doesn't taste good. And if you are wondering where that is coming from, you can see this little itty bitty hole right here that's right above the middle leg. That is going to be where the scent gland is. So if we're looking at that on our specimen, um, it's going to be kind of underneath right about here, but it's going to be right at the base of our, um, our middle leg. And he will have that on both sides. All right, so that's going to be where our stink, that's where our stink comes from. Um, and I did want to, I wanted to make sure that I could see that before I answered your question about, um, about his stench. Um, now, we also can check out their mouth parts. I think, I love, um, I love insect mouth parts. I think that um, they're kind of fascinating to look at pretty much all the time. Uh, and these guys are cool because they have piercing and sucking mouth parts and they're not predatory. So they're actually going to be piercing and feeding on plant juices rather than other animals. And exactly where that spine comes out on the top of the head is where the mouth parts start on the bottom of the head. So it actually kind of gives them this little structure. And my curiosity, there's, there's, a, there's a small part of me that wonders if this um, sharp point is actually to kind of help almost pre-drill a hole to help him feed. Um, I'm not sure what the purpose is of this spine on the front of his head, but when we zoom in, yes, you can see that that's where the spine is, and then he has these, um, it's almost like his jowls or his, the, like the sides of his mouth um are kind of over they're going over top of his mouth part um maybe we can zoom in a little further so that you can see that yeah okay so if we're looking right about let's focus right about here that gives us almost all of it um so he's got these, the, the sides of his head, these are like his jowls or his like, um, the sides of his head, I think it starts with a G. Gina? I think that insect cheeks are called Gina. G-E-N-A. Let me look it up. Yes. 
Yes. And they are, um, uh, they, uh, they're generally kind of like the side of the head, but if we're looking here, it kind of expands over. And this right here, that's the center mouth part. That's the tube that, that's his straw, his drinking straw. Um, and then you can see it has all of these little lines along the end, but if we look right about here, I'm going to zoom in even further, um, and we're going to be able to see his actual, like the actual straw, the actual straw that he's drinking from. So all insects have kind of the same pieces of their mouth parts, but they're all just adapted to do different things. Um, and when we have true bugs, they have this long straw in the center, and then they've got two pieces that kind of help protect that straw. So you can see right about here, the straw gets very thin and narrow, and then it disappears into the shaft, right? And this is what he's using to protect it. So, um... Yeah, that's what's all, that's what his mouth part's all about. Um, but so now that we've zoomed in all the way, let it let us see how long this mouth part is, because it doesn't stop here at the between the first pair of legs, and if we go all the way. His mouth part, we've got a little bit of a, a shadow from the pin here, um, but his mouth part goes, con goes and continues all the way to in between where the second and the third pair of legs come out of the ventral, come out of the bottom side of our buggy friend. So this is a very, very long straw-like mouth part that he kind of just tucks up underneath the ventral side and um, has the ability to kind of move it up a little bit, but he's still kind of piercing down into the plant that he's feeding on, right? This mouth part never goes whoop and uh, just hangs out, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really go forward. But it does have the ability to kind of have this... Um, a little bit of movement so that it can pierce into a plant. Um, let's, ah, oh man, I saw so many cool things and I want to sketch them. Um, let's check out his abdomen really quick because we might be able to guess if it's male or female. Let's check it out. Yes, Eric Eaton makes a good point. Plant feeding heteropterans or plant feeding true bugs have generally have longer rostrums or longer mouth parts. Um, the rostrum is that piercing part um, that surrounds the straw. All right, so they generally have longer rostrums than predatory species. Um, and I would think that that is because when you're talking about some, you want to feed on the plant, right? So that plant has a very, you want a kind of a long, thin straw to help you pierce into a, pierce into a plant or a tree or through bark, you know, that has to be kind of long and thin. Whereas when you've got a predatory species, like an assassin bug or a giant water bug, we did sketch a giant water bug and that rostrum was incredibly short. But that's more like, like a thumbtack, right? Um, predatory uh, mouth parts want to be short and stout so that they can have a lot of structural significance, so that they can be, like, powerful. Um, and, uh, and they'll have more control over, over their prey animals, too, if, they're, if their mouth part is shorter and stronger, more kind of stout. Um, so... That is a cool little factoid to think about kind of like the adaptations between these two animals and how that changes. There's a couple cool things I'm seeing here, so we can talk about this for a moment. I'm gonna say I believe this specimen is male um, because a lot of times in males, 
male specimens, you've got one large singular plate at the end of the abdomen, whereas in um, female specimens, you'll have three, two or three smaller triangular plates down here that have the ability to kind of open up, right? Whereas the males are going to have kind of one larger plate. Wink, wink. Okay. Um, the other thing that we can see um, from this view are the spiracles. And I don't know if we've spent a lot of much time talking about spiracles. I want to be sketching, so we're going to sketch while we talk. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and give myself kind of a basic U shape. Uh, I want it to be wider. Okay. Um, I want to give myself a shape and then I can keep talking. Um, so a lot of times when we are checking out these specimens, I like to see things like um, spiracles, genitalia pla plates, um, mouth parts, antenna. Those are the types of things that when you're doing keys, um, you're going to end up having to look at anyway, right? Um, so if I'm going through and r sketching kind of these segments, all right. So we got these individual segments and they have a little bit of shaping to them just because the body actually has this kind of arched shape. So when you're looking at the lines from a, from a ventral view, they kind of look like they arch a little bit and that's going to give our specimen just a little bit of, um, kind of like a, a little bit of shaping. Um, now, right about where my red dot is, you'll be able to see a little itty bitty dot with a little circle around it. All right, that is right about here. And that is our spiracle. And that is only one spiracle, but we do have spiracles, it looks like, on almost every abdominal segment. So I'm gonna go back and check and see how many of these segments have spiracles. Um, but this is how insects breathe, right? They don't breathe through their mouths because their mouths are busy eating, right? She is so busy um, slurping up plant juices that she has, doesn't have the ability to also use her mouth as a breathing tool. Um, so what insects do is they breathe through diffusion. Um, that little hole right there is how my insect gets oxygen. That little itty bitty hole right there, right? And each one of these little holes, let's see, I want to see how many we can find. There and there. Oh, they're going to be, they're going to be pretty much on the lateral after that. So we weren't going to be able to see them. Um, but those little holes um, lead to, um, lead to little tubes inside of the body. And then those little tubes inside of the body will supply oxygen to every cell in the insect's in, to, uh, to essentially every cell in the insect's body. Um, and it, they breathe through diffusion. Right? So humans have the ability to breathe in and to breathe out. And we actively respire, right? So we choose, I mean, it's a natural thing, but it's something that we do. Whereas insects, they can open and close their spiracles, but that just starts the diffusion and stops the diffusion. Like they have the ability to, to close their spiracles if they get put under water, for instance, so that um, they don't drown themselves. Or if they notice a poison, they can close their spiracles off. Um, but they're more like windows. So they open and close and they let air in and out of the body. And there are some people who say that this form of respiration is what allowed the insects um, back in the times of dinosaurs to be really, really big and is now limiting the size of, of, of our insects. Because back in the day of the dinosaurs, uh, back in the day of the dinosaurs, there was more oxygen within our air 
right? So um, most of what we breathe nowadays is nitrogen. And there's about, what, 20%? 22%, I'm not sure the exact number. Um, there's about 70% nitrogen and about 20% oxygen-ish in what we breathe nowadays. Um, versus back in the day when the dinosaurs were around, there was a lot higher percentage of oxygen in the air. And that allowed the diffusion to cross through the insect in it really, really large insects. They still had the ability to pump oxygen to all of their cells because there was more oxygen in the air. But as the oxygen decreased, they didn't have the ability to support um, these incredible sizes. Um, so do the spiracles somehow connect to the butt snorkel on the water bug we looked at last week? Yes. Um, in the, in the water scorpion that we looked at last week, um, at the very, very, very end of that tube, that's where the spiracle is. All right. So it's just a difference in the placement of the spiracle. Um, that hole at the end of the pipe, that would be the spiracle, and that's how she breathes. <laughs> <coughs> All right. Yep, yep, yep. They breathe through their butts. I love it. Um, so if you take an insect and you put its head underwater, it will never it will never drown. You got to put its abdomen underwater. At all, I would say most insects breathe through their abdomen. Um, some insects do have spiracles, long segments in their thorax, um, but it's always a spiracle or gills. There are uh, like baby dragonflies have anal gills. Um, let's, I don't have a specimen of a baby dragonfly, but if I was going to pretend like this was, so the spiracles are on the outside of my leaf footed bug, but we're going to go just a little bit off topic because I like, because we're going to talk about spiracles for, for a minute. Well, insect respiration, essentially. Um, now with... With baby dragonflies, um, baby dragonflies are completely predatory. They live underneath water a lot of times, fresh water, and they, um, they have the ability to just breathe underwater. They never have to come to the surface, all right? So when they're breathing, they actually have what we call anal gills, and their gills are actually, um, their anal gills are internal. So they look almost like, um, uh, let's see, they almost look something, you know, something kind of like that, where uh, your baby dragonfly has an opening in the back and the opening in its, um, at the end of its abdomen. And it has the ability to pull water, it just pulls water up into its gills. It brings water up into its body. And then when the water is floating around up here, we've got H2O, right? And then these gills have the ability to um, diffuse the ox oxygen mo molecules out of the gills, out of the water. All right, so that's a little bit about how baby dragonflies breathe. But then they also have the ability. Um, but then they also have the ability to use this um, to use their anal gills as a defensive mechanism too, kind of. Because if my dragonfly wants to move really, really fast, or if he gets scared and he has to get out of there, or if he says, "Oh my goodness, I want some food," and he starts to move towards the food, they have the ability to take their abdominal m muscles and squish all of that air out of their out of their anal gills. And they can jet propulse themselves forward, pushing air out of their anal gills. <laughs> right? So they almost have this like jet propulsion ability um, along with respiration. Uh, yes. And then I have a friend, KHA 30 S, um, mentions damselflies and their feathery gills. And you know what? Do I have a damselfly in this? 
I have a damsel fly, I swear. Really, I, I, I think I do. I do, I do! Let's check out some damsel fly gills! Um, I need alcohol. Oh, this works. You know, what's cool about um, having everything right here is I have the ability to just kind of pull things as we want to see them. So, <laughs> looking for a pair of forceps. My forceps are MIA. <laughs> Finger time. Okay. So, this is a baby damselfly. <laughs> propulsion farts exactly dragonfly babies have propulsion farts and when I'm teaching students I generally don't get that far into them because you know they end up with all the fart jokes but I think that it's really a cool little thing alright let's see getting my friend all focused yeah I'm hoping that they don't I mean, it's a scientific word. That's what they're called. Need a little bit more alcohol. You want this specimen to be completely underneath the alcohol so that when we're looking at the specimen, we don't end up with those, um, we don't end up with those, uh, like shiny parts. Let's see. All right, so in damselflies, these are the gills, all right? In damselflies, um, how much was my USB microscope? Um, my microscope is from Amscope, and I believe that the microscope portion, I think my microscope was somewhere in like the, you know what? I'm not sure. I would have to look it up. So I purchased the microscope, the, the Amscope microscope, and the Amscope camera separately. I'm running an MU-1000, um, the Amscope MU-1000 uh, USB um, mic, and... That's probably a question that more that more people are going to ask, so I will make sure that I look up the uh, the numbers on my microscope just in case you guys want to check it out. I I'm gonna say that like my microscope is awesome and I love it and I enjoy it. It is it was not the most expensive microscope on the planet. Um, Amscope is generally a little cheaper, but they still make really great cameras, and so they have this ability to have awesome lenses, and I've got all of the extra pieces, so um, it's been working out pretty well for me. So when we're looking at this damselfly, um, thank you, Chaos. <laughs> oh, I see it now. I see Chaos. Okay. Um, so when we're looking at this damselfly, this is the end of its abdomen. And instead of having um, internal anal gills, my damselfly has almost a very kind of thin abdomen. And then at the very, very end, they're going to have three what almost look like tails. But, oh, excuse me. But um, these are actually gills. So they'll have this kind of center stalk, almost like a feather, and then they come out and they move in. And sometimes when you're collecting damselfly larvae, uh, their tails can fall off. So it can be almost like, 
you know, he was supposed to have three, but now he only has two. Um, but they do can, they can't even like spread out like this, right? And this is an insect that breathes through, um, that also breathes through diffusion, right? So they still breathe through diffusion. They still have the ability to move those oxygen molecules um, through small tubes in their body. It's just a different way that they have the ability to kind of pick up the oxygen. Um, when you've got fans like this, my damselfly actually will have the ability to kind of, um, to kind of like wave them around. Um, and when they wave them around, they're kind of shifting the water around them and it'll help them to, um, it'll help them pick up more oxygen. All right, give me two seconds. I just had a, I just had a thought. Now, um, I'm, I'm on a roll here. Yes. Let we can we can definitely talk about the um the uh the uh I believe it's the labrum, not the labial palps. Um but yes, dragonflies and damselflies both have these um have a mouth part that kind of sits underneath and this is like their lower jaw, their labrum. And the labrum has this extra little joint down here. And so it can expand and then grab its food and then pull it back to its mouth. And I can show you that. Um, I'm just gonna need to go and grab myself a dissecting probe and a pair of forceps so that I can, so that I can pull it out. Um, I wanted to, there's one more thing I wanted to tell you guys about, and then I forgot the word for it. Oh, man. I was hoping that I would find it in the, in the sketch, but it's not going to happen. Plastron. The word is plastron. We'll talk about plastrons in a minute. I'm going to go grab my... Um, Um, I'm going to go grab uh, a pair of forceps and a dissecting probe. I'll be back in two seconds. <laughs> all right, so I've got, um, this is my little leather pouch for, uh, for all my bug tools. And I've got... Um, a dissecting probe that's going to just be a long guy with a little point on the end. And I think I'm going to grab... Uh, these are jeweler's forceps. They're nice and sharp. Don't mind my head as it disappears into my microscope. All right. Oh, man. This is fun. So, um, as we are looking at just this image right here, before I start poking at the specimen, because once I start poking, um, you guys are mostly just going to have to, like, watch. I'm not going to be able to watch both directions. Um, bedtime. All right. Bye, Elizabeth. It was nice to hang out with you. Um, this is the whole bottom jaw. All right, you can see an eye here and I hear the antenna are coming out. But the bottom jaw, the labrum, actually goes from here all the way back here. And it actually then also comes back up and reconnects. Um, you can see right here and right here, those are actually going to be my damselflies. Um, those are going to be my damselflies. Uh, chewing mouth parts, it's mandibles, right? So this is the where it's kind of going to open and close and kind of grab with. Um, so let's see. Let's see how well I can do this and also hold the specimen straight. It's going to be fun. Um, yeah. All right, we're gonna need another pair of forceps. 
So close. All right, my specimen is not going to be nice because it's looking like I don't want I don't want to hurt the specimen and it's kind of a little it's acting a little bit solid. Um so instead of hurting the specimen, we've got it a little bit on its side. And um, this is the joint right here, and the joint then comes all the way back up. So instead of hurting the specimen, I will draw it for you. All right. So if we imagine a lateral view, it's, that's kind of the easiest way for me to sketch it. Um, so if we're imagining a lateral view, the mouth part connects up here uh, um, near the... F mm, I've got to draw that circle a little bigger, huh? We're just going to imagine that that's the head. All right. Um, the mouth part connects up here, and then it comes all the way back down in this direction, and then... And then like this, right? So this piece is what pushes forward and grabs onto the food. Um, and the characteristics on this guy, the, um, you can actually almost identify a damselfly all the way down to family um, just by looking at its labrum, um, at its uh, labium and its antennal segments. All right, so that's a little bit about him. Um, I wanted to, really quick, get into a little bit, just, just, the, just a little bit, just like the smallest bit of, um, of, of chemistry. Um, because we've been talking about oxygen molecules and breathing, we've got the anal gills, we've got the feathery gills, and I can't go and talk about respiration and anal gills and these feathery gills without talking about a moth that has the ability to dive under the water. Um, there are aquatic moths. And um, as caterpillars, they actually look like they're covered in little hairs, and the caterpillars actually live underwater. They make, um, there's a couple of different forms, a different kind of like ways that they'll live, but um, the ones that I'm thinking about uh, have all of these, they look like they're super hairy. They've got tufts all over them, and those are all um, the way that they breathe. Those are all like little gills, essentially. Um, and then they cut little discs little like leaf discs and they stitch them together with silk and then they live in like a little leaf disc and they feed on plants and they're caterpillars and they hang out underwater. Um, but their eggs have to be laid underwater. Yeah, aquatic moths. You never would have guessed, right? And these moths actually have to dive into the water and lay their eggs. All right, so... We've got some water here, and this water is, you know, wet. And my wath, moth, my wath, moth can't get wet. Um, so if this isn't going to be the best sketch of a moth, but we're gonna we're gonna go for it. All 
All right, so I've got the head, the thorax, the abdomen. We have some wings here. Keep in mind, moths have four wings. They've got these legs. And these, in particular, <laughs> just dive into the water. All right, so these moths are covered in little itty bitty hairs. They're all over the place. The head, the legs, the wings, and these little itty bitty hairs are something called hydrophobic, which is one word, but I didn't leave enough space for it. So we're gonna try that again. All right, hydrophobic. And if you wanna break that down, we've got hydro, which means water, and phobic, which means you're afraid of it. Fear or afraid, right? And what that means is that these hairs, these hydrophobic hairs, what chemists mean is that they push water away, right? They say, nope. Um, and hydrophobe, there's actually like hydrophobic paints out there that make it so that you can't get wet, right? Well, these guys have hydrophobic hairs. So as they cross the surface of the water, they are not only diving into the water, but because they have so many hairs all over their body, they are actually carrying a small air bubble with them. So as they dive into the water, they are not getting wet. All right. The water doesn't actually ever touch them um, because they just dive down into it and they're covered in these hairs that are pushing all the water away. Um, and then once they get underwater, um, and then once they get underwater, they will be completely surrounded in an air bubble. Well, then they have to go about their business, right? They have to go about and lay their eggs. They've got to do all of the things. A good number of them do get eaten by fish. So many of them do not survive coming back out of the water, but some of them do. Some of them can come back out of the water and fly around again. Um, they still have to be able to breathe though. Right, and they're underwater for long periods of time. So this air bubble that is, surrounds the insect and is gonna help with respiration is called a plastron. All right, and um, the plastron has oxygen inside, it has nitrogen inside, right? It's just the air bubble that it pulled up from the top. So it's made up of all of those things. And my insect is using that bubble to breathe, right? So she is pulling the oxygen into her spiracles and then she is releasing gases, off-gassing. Now, as she is swimming around the water and using the oxygen in her bubble, the oxygen from the oxygen in the water, as long as the water is oxygenated, right? She doesn't have the ability to split hydrogen and oxygen molecules. That'd be scary. But she, if there are oxygen molecules around in the water, they will actually diffuse into the plastron. But the water molecules, because she still has hydrophobic hairs, can't get in. So as she is swimming through the water using this little bubble, she is her plastron is also diffusing oxygen and refilling her bubble so that she can just continue to kind of live and breathe under there. So I actually have an entire, I have like a four minute YouTube video about, about these moths. If you guys wanted to go and check, the, check that out. Um, you could go to my YouTube channel and just search aquatic moths and you would find it. Um, water striders have small hydrophobic hairs to float. Yes, exactly. So there's a variety of insects that will use hydrophobic hairs in a variety of ways, right? As they adapt and change, they fill niches um, and all of the things. All right, so, man, we got around to 
we got around to sketching our western leaf-footed bug, and that was uh, a fun little task to check out the legs and the mouth parts and the abdomen and all that stuff. Um, and then checking out respiration, right, via spiracles or anal gills or these little flan guys or, you know, something even more complex. Um, yeah, I think we're having a good time. Now, um, is, do I have other questions, comments? Is there another insect you guys want to talk about or see? Yeah. Yeah. I like to blow your guys' minds at the very end, you know, to leave you wanting just a little bit more. Um, and so I like, and especially, uh, you guys always ask the best questions, right? So you're over here asking me about insect breathing and defensive mechanisms, and um, I end up looking at scent glands and all types of stuff. And it's really your guys, you guys guiding me and telling me, you know, what you're interested in that can, you know, put me on little crazy, little, little, little crazy uh, travel stories. Um, so... Uh, if we don't have too many other questions, I have uh, a handful more things that I've got to get done tonight before I'm allowed to go to sleep. Um, so uh, I did something kind of fun, and I made myself an end slide. Check that out. Okay, um, I have one more question before we get to before we get to the end. Um, Uh, and that is, how do I euthanize my insects? Now, um, my insects, it depends on the specimen that we're working with. Um, uh, things like, um, things like, har things that are hard-bodied, like, um, beetles and a lot of times wasps and flies, a lot of those types of insects, I like to put directly into alcohol to bring home, and then I'll pull them out of alcohol to pin them. So, like, uh, this is a longhorn beetle that I collected that is in ethanol that needs, still needs to go into, um, that still needs to get pinned. Um, but they have the ability, they, this, um, this guy's been in here for a handful of years, but I haven't had a problem with pinning right out of alcohol. Um, things like moths and butterflies, you can't do this to, right? Um, because you end up with scales everywhere and destroyed specimens. So what I end up doing for, um, and I don't have a, a needle with me right now, but what I end up doing for butterflies and moths is I carry around... Um, I, I carry around a, a small hypodermic needle, essentially, and I will um, uh, inject them with just a little bit of alcohol right at the base of their legs um, so that they can't kind of flap around, and that is a nice way to do it, and it's also fairly quick. Um, and I can leave them in a paper triangle, and I'll then put that put the triangle into another plastic bag Especially on, like, longer trips. If I'm going on, like, a five-week trip and I need the specimens to still be nice when I get home, I'll put the triangles into a plastic bag, and then I'll put a little bit more alcohol on a paper towel and put it in the bag with it to keep them hydrated. Um, if um, It's always better to pin the specimen right away, but if you don't have the opportunity, that's one way to do it. Um... And then, uh, doop, 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 doop. Alcohol, um, kill jars are another way. So, uh, you can take any type of sealed jar, a sealed plastic jar or a sealed glass jar, and you can, um, take a little cotton swab or a little bit of paper towel, and you can put... A uh, nail polish remover, as long as it's the non, use non-acetone nail polish remover, um, because that, the main chemical in that is called ethyl acetate, and that's going to be something that will kill bugs semi-nicely. It kind of asphyxiates them. So you call them, we call them kill jars. And so you essentially put the, put the ethyl acetate on a paper towel or a cotton swab and you throw it in the jar and then you can just throw the insects in there. Um, and that will dispatch them. 
When storing dragonfly specimens, how do you solve the loss of coloration? Uh, that is a little bit more of a cruel process, um, but I can explain it to you. Um, dragonflies, as you know, lose a lot of... Um, Dragonflies lose a lot of their color as they are dying, and plus, dragonflies, um, it's not a structural color. It's a pigmented color. So you're going to lose some of that brightness. Um, but what you can do is you have to have... Hmm, you have to have kind of like a flat bottom container, um, almost like... Oh, kind of like this, um, where it's nice and flat. Uh, this has stuff in it, but it's nice and flat. And then you put a layer or like, um, a little bit of a depth of acetone. You use acetone, um, in it. And then the people that I've talked to that do this will, um, use microscope slides, but anything that's kind of heavy and flat, so what you do is you collect the dragonfly alive, and then you turn them upside down so that their wings are along the bottom of the container, and then you put the microscope slides on either side, and you dispatch them in the acetone. And the acetone pulls their fat and the muscle out of their body so quickly that the color tends to stay. That's the best I got. It's a little tricky, but it's how, but it's how people do it. My part challenges. When storing dragonfly specimens, thanks. Do you study this stuff or do you do this stuff in some kind of professional capacity? Is it a hobby? All right. So, um, I have covered the scale of entomology. I've done a lot, a lot in it. So, um, obviously my love of insects started very, very young. So it started as a hobby, as something that I loved to do. Um, I went to school for it. So I do have an entomology degree. It's a bachelor's in entomology from Michigan State. Um, I graduated from Michigan State in 2013. And then afterwards, I worked in a research lab. So I worked um, as a lab manager, and I taught undergrads how to do research and did um, classical biological control of the brown marmorated stink bug. So that invasive brown stink bug that's all over your houses and stuff, um, I was trying to come up with a way to um, control them using a small parasitoid wasp called Trisulcus japonicus. Um, during that research project, that project lasted three or four years before my PI retired. Um, but during that project, I was actually able to travel all over the state of Michigan and collect stink bugs. And at some point, I had something like 24 species of native stink bugs in uh, colonies in the lab. And so I have pictures of all of the instars of of all of these stink bugs and um unfortunately they never got published and that makes me sad but maybe someday i will i'll like show them off on the website or something um so i did this research for a while um that was i was faculty staff there at michigan state so um the students uh came up to me and we started in the msu bug club and we won the homecoming parade the first year so that was fun but um, after that, I created my own business called Insectopia and started doing traveling and education. Um, education is what I really love. So do I do it in a professional capacity? I think that um, this is what I do. Um, education is what I do and is what I love. I'm not working at another place right now. I am just doing this. Um, I was, for about four years, working as the Director of Education at the Philadelphia Insectarium and Butterfly Pavilion. Um, so, um, I worked as the Director of Education. I created 
hundreds if not thousands of educational programs for them had a wonderful time um but there is actually a documentary about my experience there no not about my experience in particular but um there's a documentary <laughs> called bug out and it just released on amazon or it's about to release in about 25 minutes um and I think that you might be able to go and see it now. It may have dropped a little early. Um, but it's a documentary about the above and underground bug trade. All right. Um, while I was at the Philadelphia Insectarium in 2018, we had, um, a, they call it the buglery. There was a heist. Someone stole a bunch of insects from the, from the museum. And so... There's a four-part documentary that just came out that um, describes all of that and some of the crazy conflicts that I've gone through in the last couple of years. It's kind of wild. Amazon actually had me wait to resign my position until they could get there to film me packing up my office and driving away. So um, that is going to be an interesting scene for me to watch um, and to kind of look back on. That was back in July. Um, so right now, yeah, I am an informal educator. Yeah, I guess that's how you would say it. Right now I am working just as a, um, as an educator. So I have this right here. Um, I have an out school, I have out school classes that are available for students. So all of us, all of us adults don't get to, don't, don't get to join these. But if you know a kid who really loves bugs, I like, I have, um, a junior bug club for kids that are five to eight. And I have a weekly insect studies club that is for nine to 12. Um, and like an illustration club and all types of stuff. And we meet weekly, or um, I teach like insect communication um, tomorrow morning, for instance. I've got spaces open for that. Um, but I'm teaching on out school as a um, as kind of a little bit of extra. I have my um, I've got this YouTube channel that's going around. It's super super helpful if you guys subscribe. Um, my Instagram has all of these things that we call guess that bug. Um, and so I post three images and over the course of the day, 10 a.m., 12 p.m., and then 5 p.m. And people can go in there and guess. Um, people can go and guess what the insect is, right? So this is like the pronotum. And then the second image was this awesome like head-on image of, of my friend's head. And then at five o'clock, I realized, check this out. What we've been looking at all day trying to figure out is this longhorn beetle. Right, and I do this every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So if you guys want to see Insectopia at 2015, that's my Instagram account, and it does help. This, 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 this one, yeah, that one. That little QR code helps out a little bit too. Um, if you've really enjoyed hanging out with me today and you feel like you've gained a little bit of information, I'm, I, this is what I do and what I love, and I'd love to continue doing it. So. Um, every little bit helps, essentially. You know, buy me a coffee. That'd be great. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for everyone hanging out with me today. I think, uh, yeah, that gives a little bit of what I do, who I am, how I, how I got into it. And um, we're going to keep doing it because bugs are life. Yeah, bugs are life. Perfect. All right. So um, if that is the bug apocalypse. Yeah, seriously. All right. Just finishing up on the comments. I think that I got all of them answered. Oh, thank you, Chaos. I super appreciate it. Um, so I also do this, right? I live stream Thursdays at 10 p.m. Eastern time. And I actually, this week, am now open, I've opened up another session for all of my friends in Europe in the GMT time because this one starts at 4 a.m. for them. So um, on Sundays, I'm going to be doing the same thing at 4 p.m. Um, if that is a time that is, uh, if that's a time that is more, uh, that's more better. That's more better for you. I, I'm also going to be live streaming on Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Yeah, so I've been all over the place. And 
every summer I travel to Arizona and I collect bugs and I like to vlog about it and send pictures to everybody and I'm really excited that I have a brand I have a brand new black lighting equipment coming in um, that's gonna be built for me a thousand watt bulb and so I'm so excited to get that up and running and to show you guys all the cool bugs I'm gonna collect with it um, another thing that I've been thinking about I've been thinking about is um, doing live streams that are um, outside. I'm thinking I might figure out how to live stream a black light so that we can go ultra, we can go black lighting together. Would that be something that you guys are interested in? Marley, you've got a YouTube channel. I'd love to. I'd I'd love to. I'd love to partner with you. Yeah, I'm about to watch. I'm about to watch this documentary. I haven't seen it yet. Um, even though I'm in it, they wouldn't let us see it until it displayed. So I'm, that's that's what I'm about to go and do once we finish. Once we press exit. Deborah says yes. You would be interested in blacklighting, nature journaling at a blacklight. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, sounds like a plan. I'm gonna have to find. Um, I'm gonna have to find a park that has Wi-Fi that's going to allow me to do it. Um, but I would like that. Yes. Um, if we were black lighting together, I'm going to say that I probably wouldn't have my sketchbook on me. It would mostly be like the camera and the viewing and I'd be chatting and you guys can sketch and do all of the things. I think that that would be so much fun. Um, oh, National Moth Week. Ah, um, Eric, do you know what week that is? I would love to get involved with National Moth Week. That would be so much fun. Yeah, so I'm down. I'm down for all of the bug things. If you guys have a cool idea and you're like, Trisha, you should definitely be doing this, and I would come and watch you, I will say yes. It's what I do. Oh, man. So I'm going to have to look up the dates of National Moth Week to see about that. And then you guys can sketch and I can take pictures because I really like photography at Black Lights. Um, I have... Uh, one of my favorites is the poetry moth. I took a picture of a poetry moth in Arizona last summer, and I was pretty proud of that one. Yes, last summer when I was, I went on a five-week road trip. Was, I went on a five-week solo road trip across the country collecting bugs every night and just reading old insect journals and, and just learning from the greats and kind of just existing in the wild. I uh, dispersed, camped, and set up a black light every night. And there was one night that um, I had an armadillo just kind of wander into my campsite, and it just kept it was within like four feet of me. I'm like, you don't need to be any closer. I can see you, friend. Um, but that was actually a really cool spot because it was also next to this like marshy area and the um, tetrigids, the little dwarf grasshoppers were coming into my black light. Um, and I think I collected three or four different species of dwarf grasshoppers that night. And I haven't been able to identify them yet because they're kind of tricky. Awesome. July 23rd to the 31st. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to put my website on my closing page. Derp. I, guys, I, um, within this last week, I also created a website and they put a space in it. It's theinsectopia.com. www.theinsectopia.com. And um, you can go and check out and, and check that out if you want. I'm just gonna be it's it's just like a place where you can find all of the things. But also, I've got a little blog. I wrote a little post about Argentine ants and um, their ability to kind of spread over the continents. Um, and the fact that not only do they have super colonies, but that they've got, like, this huge mega colony between the three largest super colonies in the, across the globe. So there's this invasive ant from Argentina that, and from South America that has now on every continent and is... Um, 
Uh, super aggressive towards other ants. Awesome. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. All right, I think that I think that we are all good here. I've got all types of awesome ideas. I'm going to reach out to National Moth Week. That's a good one. I was also thinking about joining up and kind of um, helping out with um, what's the I, there's an iNaturalist event that's a bio blitz that's like competitive between cities. I have to remember the name of it, but I was thinking about kind of joining up with that one too. That would be fun. All right. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of their week. Um, we had a good time today chatting about all the things. Go ahead and check out all the things that I'm getting buried in. And um, I hope that everyone, um, yeah, I hope that you have a good time. So bye, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>